hello and uh, good afternoon, good morning, whatever time of day uh, you are tuning in here today. This is the Dr. Lake Show. I'm uh, really pleased to be here once again today. Uh, sitting with me, I have uh, Sandra Sova, who is um, going to be talking with us today and a continuation of the conversation around self-regulation and, and how we can change our lives in spite of circumstances we have. And as well, I have uh, Dylan Soriano Powling. Uh, Dylan, hi. Hello. Hi, how you doing? Good. How are you ladies doing? Very, very good. Super excellent. Yes. And, and awesome. you know, I just to introduce you, Sandra, we've known each other for a while and I know that we've done radio uh, at uh, local radio here at CHLY. Um, and that's really how you got launched. Uh, there was a number of things that happened. But I'd like to give a little bit, bit of background mm-hmm. um, for people who are uh, just uh, listening for the first time and we're, we're meeting you for the first time here. Um, I know that you've gone through a lot of adversities. Mm-hmm. And the reason I find you know your story particularly interesting is because um, I, I know that we use adversity as um, often a reason that we can't be happy or that we can't feel um, content within our lives. And um, one of the things I found really impressive about your journey has been that you have had adversity and you have had to face a lot of difficult situations and and yet you've made some really amazing transformations that I can see mm-hmm. been in the last few years. Um, and I'd like to talk to people, have people know about that a little bit. Um, just to give a bit of background, um, you were diagnosed at eight years of age with... Um, rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah, that's an inflammatory arthritis. Um, people often mistakenly hear the word arthritis and they think that that's only a condition of people that are quite advanced at age. Uh, but no, I was eight years old. Yeah, that's amazingly young. Yeah. I can't even imagine how a child would receive that kind of information, especially when you want to play and be part of everything with other kids, right? Mm-hmm. And So that must have been huge. Um, but you, in spite of that, you still managed to get yourself into uh, fairly prominent positions in the workplace. Um, you were working, you, you mentioned part of these larger organizations and companies. You were... Uh, creating policy procedure, you were hiring, you were doing interviews. So you played a really prominent role in sort of the management of yeah, I was um, I was the customer service and call center manager for um, large consumer based uh, corporations, and that went uh, everything from having a staff of about thirty people who I would uh, be responsible for, and also be responsible for those those call numbers and the yeah. answer time and the abandon rate. And so it was a it was a great job, but a very stressful job. Yeah, yeah. So you you toughed it out. I'm taking it. Yeah. (laughs) Because I'm going, you know, it's hard enough doing a job that has inherent stress, but then on top of it, you have a physical condition you're trying to manage. And, you know, at least in my impression, and I'm not sure mm, about um, what people know or the public knows about um, rheumatic arthritis, um, I've always had the impression it's considerably more debilitating. Um, and you know, I know there's been progress in terms of treatment, Mm -hmm. but I just know of people that have been completely debilitated by it, that, um, physically, even their movements, fine, fine coordinated movements. Um, even at, at one time it caused deformity and and it's and it still does i mean i'm very i'm very fortunate that most through most of it it was isolated to just one one area one joint my one of my knees but the thing with rheumatoid arthritis is that it's an inflammatory condition and it affects more than just the joint and the bone it affects you systemically throughout your entire system and can have impact on your organs and is very taxing not just the disease but a lot of the medications make me more prone to heart attack or stroke or blood clots and so you have to it it uh, it it is a, it's a it's a pretty serious disease. I'm lucky I didn't have a lot of the deformity issues, but it is, um, 
yeah, it, it, uh, it's like I said, it's systemic. It affects more than just the joints. Yeah, and it's not something you just ignore, right? You go, no. oh, you know, okay, yeah. I, uh, I can kind of pretend it doesn't exist. It, it's an existence mm-hmm. that you're living constant, with on a, yeah. on a daily basis. Um, and, and, you know, from my understanding, then you were, I don't know what the term is, but you were in a position where you had to step back from all work Mm -hmm. Uh, engagement. Yeah. And so that was, Paula, that was actually really, really difficult for me to get to a place where I was able to do that. Um, Both my um, rheumatologist and my GP had for about two or three years been recommending that I I stop work. It was finally when I was in my GP's office that over and over again, I would show up there and I was just like, I was, I was broken. I was exhausted. And I decided that I would take that medical leave because at that point I had dedicated with having a chronic illness that was very active, very active disease activity. All I was doing was getting up and pushing myself in order to show up for that job. And that took, that it consumed my life. And then when I finally did take the leave, I, I was so, it was a failure. It felt like a failure that I couldn't do it. Because one of the things, just to just to back up, what one of the things that did make me so um, successful in the roles in the corporate world was from a very early age, mentioning that I was diagnosed at eight years old. I learned to, I learned to deal with it. I learned to deal with things. I learned to push through, and so I would always do that. But it's a double-edged sword. Sometimes that was really good for my employer. Sure, sure. My bosses always, always loved the dedication that I, that I did, yeah. but that was not really good for me as an individual. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and working your, working yourself to the absolute breaking point is, you know, it was a, it actually turned out to be quite a, um, quite a damaging situation. Yeah. But then when I, when I finally did, you know, I had to, I physically could no longer do it anymore. I yeah. had to take that leave. Yeah, you know, I, it's it's interesting that that whole idea uh, because our culture really pushes for um, push through, push through, mm-hmm. over, and and our self esteem is actually tied to our productivity. Yep. Um, at, at least in our society, um, so I can completely understand that would have been a huge mind shift for you because it sounds like you really adopted that push through, ignore. And not everybody does that, just to say, you know. No, and, and yeah. I also identified very positively with my career. I was proud of the work that I had done and, and the advancements that I had made. I was I was feeling I was feeling in a good in a good place about it. So yeah, it was yeah. A, it was it was a tough one. Yeah. The, all the grief and, you know, sense of identity because we, we our identity yeah. gets tied up in the work that we're doing, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, and then you got this other blow, uh unexpected i don't know how long mm-hmm. after that happened you ended up getting diagnosed with breast cancer absolutely yeah, yeah. i finally so we, we had moved all of the corporate work with it was over on in in vancouver so when we moved finally back to vancouver island i was like okay i am finally going to de-stress i won't have that big commute anymore i'll be closer to family thinking at the time that would be good and <laughs> All of this kind kind of stuff, and you just recover. I mean, moving for anyone is exhausting, right? Yeah, but when you've absolutely. got a chronic condition on top of that, so I was. Uh, we landed um, on October thirty first in twenty twelve, and then December of the following year in twenty thirteen, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Dear Lord. So it was. It was, um, you know, totally totally unexpected. Of course, I mean, who would expect something like that? But the next the next year was all based on treatments and surgeries and chemotherapy and and all that and but what they don't tell you when you go through a cancer experience is that after your treatment is over your journey is not over you're actually then entering a really really tough phase and it took me it took me 3 full years after treatment was completed before i could even get my head above water and catch my breath. Wow. And then that's when I went into um, a caregiving role for my parents. Oh, yes. So like that's like so I'm also bounding with energy. From that's right. That's right. Cancer. So, I, wow. and again, still carrying forth that I can do it. 
yeah. I can be there for others. And I really, I really embraced that. Um, I embraced that again after my, um, when I went, th- when, uh, when I started being a caregiver for, for my, for my parents, things started to get really, really crazy, crazy for me on a stress, stress level. Stress is something that anyone with an autoimmune condition can tell you absolutely that if you are exposed to a lot of, a lot of stress, you, your, your disease activity will increase your, your condition will be exasperated by that. And so being in that situation, I, st- I started to get sick wow. again and in different ways though. Yes. And I started to really get a lot of physical, just physical trauma in my body. My body just was was not functioning any anymore in a lot of ways. And that was that was the final, that was the wake up call. That was something sort of clicked at that time. Mm-hmm. And I then made a decision to reinvent my life and to be what I what I say all the time on my radio show and my podcast is to be in the driver's seat for my health yes. and wellness. Yes. And I had got, I got fed up enough that I had just, I have been through a lot and challenging through, and I wasn't willing to give away my health, my happiness, my vitality, my life to other situations. I needed to take control. And that was, you know, about, let's see, I've been doing the radio show for two and a half years. It was just kind of, so about three years ago. Yeah. I decided to make some real changes. And I talk about how, I mean, it's it's an interesting story. It is my story, having rheumatoid arthritis and going through breast cancer and stuff like that. But it is never a poor me, oh, what's, what's happened to you story. Yeah. It was ended up being, those two things have ended up being the absolute biggest gifts in my entire life. Because after going through that, it allowed me to really look at this life that I had through a different lens and to value it so much more. And for the very first time to actually embrace self-care and to make myself the priority, very, very foreign from what I had ever done. I was not used to that. That's just amazing. I mean, uh, you know, I, my experience working with a lot of different people is, um, you know, it, we always have this nice phrase, adversity can make you stronger. And I think, but my, I, I revised that one. I think adversity could make, can make you stronger, but may not necessarily make you stronger because it really depends on how you deal with it. Mm-hmm. And I see people get stuck and, and um, I have great compassion for how that can happen. Cause I think all of us have the capacity to get stuck, but especially with pain, um, that breaking out of that concept that my life, I have no life now that I have this, mm-hmm. these conditions, um, I, I have no choice because of this situation, um, how easy it is to get completely trapped. And I think, uh, you know, in understanding the brain, that's what happens. Mm-hmm. Um, you could have stayed trapped. Mm-hmm. You could have. Right. I, I often ask people when, when uh, coaches is what I've been asking when I did my radio show, um, what, when do people change? When the pain of staying the same is worse than the pain of changing. Because mm-hmm. there is pain involved in change to some degree. Oh, it's, I use the phrase a lot, you got to do the work and it is work. Yeah. It doesn't just naturally happen. Change but that is, if you want a different result, you have to make the changes and we have to be willing willing to do that. And for me, making really s- small changes over the course of time, in, like I would start in, in one area and try to, so I, first I started with, this, with the stress component. And then there was a lot of looking at how I was reacting to situations. So the stressful situation that I was in, I couldn't necessarily change or remove myself to that but what could I do what was the one thing that I could control it was my response to that and that was a whole learning process a discovery process breaking of habits learning new techniques new learning different ways and you have to be willing to do it because it is easy to to follow the old patterns easy it's that's a that's a non-effortful approach (laughs) is just do what you've always been doing right yeah 
Yeah, but it was, um, yeah, so making making some changes and just being a lot of the things like um, that really helped with a lot of the, the physical changes that I've made. So in the past year and a half, I finally decided to address um, my weight issue. I have been overweight all of my all of my life and when doing the radio show i had the opportunity to interview some of the top research scientists in canada in the field of um, of arthritis and rheumatology and sitting across from this this top research scientist in canada scientist in canada who actually used to be my rheumatologist when i was in vancouver and hear her say and describe that the stress of your heart and the risk of heart attack and a shortened lifespan just from having arthritis and then on top of that being overweight and the amount of changes that a little that, that could make it it's like you kind of always know this mm-hmm. but it was it was another one of my wake up pay attention yeah. and one of the other things one of the the characteristics that i have that sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not is i am stubborn and so right there, right there in that chair, sitting across from her, just like you and I are in right now, I was, I am going to do this because I can't sit here and pretend that it is not going to impact my life. So each and every time with the changes, for me, it has started with absolutely deciding and making that choice and then being stubborn and following, following through and being consistent and then finding you need the supports around you to do that you can this it's not it's not something it's that not you can do isolation. in isolation no, no 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 one one thing that i want to really i'm trying to draw out certain aspects of that experience because um i i think it's a, a an example uh of how so often we want our circumstance to change and you know there you know don't get me wrong if we can I say go to it. Change, mm-hmm. change your circumstance. If, if it's a one that you're not fulfilled with and it's within your capacity to change it, that's the beauty of agency is we can t- make those decisions. But this is one of those situations where um, you were not changing and focusing on getting rid of rheum- rheumatoid arthritis or or I'm going to you know eliminate the stress of having to manage parents and, um, it was a, an in, inward change. Mm-hmm. It was something that happened in you that allowed you to experience life in a dramatically different way without even necessarily w- w- a recognition. I love the serenity prayer. Grant me the serenity to mm-hmm. accept the things that I, um, to change the things I can change and the, um, the courage, sorry, courage to change the things that I can change and the uh, ability to accept the things I cannot and the wisdom to know the difference. And and I, I think that is, for me, uh, an example. And, you know, one thing I do encounter often is people will who struggle with their symptoms, it might be pain or something chronic, is they are really good at arguing for their limitations, for what oh, they yes. can't do. And they will argue till they're red in the face and tell you, tell you what they can't do. But not much time is spent reorienting it it's to what you can do and, and how that can change your life. So I just want to say that is what I'm most impressed with is the fact that you changed internally. Yeah, it is an internal change. And it's it's become something that I'm fiercely protected of, protective of now. Yeah. Before, I would really just lead my life in response to what was going on around me whether that be, you know, a work situation or other people's demands or needs, I was always be in response mode. Now, again, I'm in the driver's seat. I decide. I make those decisions. And the thing about having having a chronic illness, a lot of what I talk about on my on on my show and my podcast is the the upside of that, you know, the coping ways that you can cope and and the things, but that's not to take away that pain absolutely that it sucks it's hard it's it not does. easy yeah. but if i i made a decision really early on on this even before i transformed and re- reinvented myself i made the decision very early on that having pain or discomfort 
was not going to dictate how my day would be. Yeah. Would not make doesn't would not affect affect my my mood or my things because the fact of the matter is if I let having pain dictate how my day was going to be, I would have a crappy day every single day. Yeah. And again, that's not something that I that doesn't fuel me. That doesn't feed me. Having yeah. um it's 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 the antithesis of what I what I want to do. So you just yeah. it's a it's a choice, and you and it's a choice you make over and over again. Yeah. There there was I remember saying saying that um, uh, energy energy flows where attention goes, and so we're, we're, wherever we put our attention in our life is where we get and end up getting back. Because what I have seen with you is it's it that your actual once you did change and work on changing mm-hmm. what was happening inside of you, you also started to experience a lot more things changing outside of you. Yes. And yeah. and, and I, I think that's a that's a principle in my mind that that's a that we need that's the core focus we need to be spending time with. Um yeah. So Dylan, I don't know if you wanna share anything. I I heard this quote the other day. Um it was something like it's hard to be unhealthy, but it's also hard to keep fit. Um, it's hard to be like financially responsible, but it's also hard to be broke. And you kind of just have to choose your hearts in this life. <laughs> yeah, I like that. <laughs> I know it's kind of cynical, but I like that. <laughs> um, that's, that totally yeah. came into my mind because yeah, it's, yeah. it's just the truth. Like either way, you're going to be dealing with adversity. Um, so to hear that, like you know, you saw that path in front of you. Um, that sort of fork in the road yeah, and definitely. you you chose the one that um, was probably harder to do but of course it's going to make you live a uh, more fulfilling life I think um, be better to people so that's awesome because I've met so many people um, dealing with chronic pain and it just looms over them it looms um, over them demeanor, yeah and, revolves around and, the pain and that, that that's all that they know even how to talk about and focus on and and I you know and I say this with compassion because I, I do not in any oh, shape yeah, or form. Oh, yeah, I don't blame them. <laughs> absolutely. I just, I understand how you, we, we can all get caught in it. And it, in some cases, it might be pain. In other cases, it might be we talk always about the hurt we have from what's been done to us. And I mean, we all can fall into this place. Um, the question isn't whether you've fallen just knowing that you don't have to stay there. And that's really the message I want people to get is um, that you can have all these things and you might even feel stuck and you might feel like that's the only thing that exists in your life and it's it's destroying it. But um, I think that's the messages of hope that say that you can actually experience some things and adversities and still do enjoy life and still mm-hmm. get joy out of life um so i think the question people would wonder firstly i just want to acknowledge that you have since started a podcast which you've mentioned um what what is the name of your podcast chronically right? driven chronically di- driven you've um also you continued with your local radio mm-hmm. um but i think people would like to know how like what what did you do? What were some of the things that you found were helpful as mm-hmm, you moved mm-hmm. as you moved in this direction? Well, part of it is a, is recognizing where I wanted to make change, and then taking responsibility and kind of almost a, a lot of the way I approach things, I sort of reverse engineer it. Mm-hmm. What do I want the outcome to be? Well, how am I, how am I going to get there? And a lot of things with the way that I would, um, I had to do a lot of work with setting boundaries because okay. if I'm going to say, all right, so I'm recognizing that stress is a challenge for me, not just irritates me, but it has actual physical repercussions. If I know that that's, that's true and I want to make a difference. So what are some of the tools that I can do and breaking those patterns and those, those habits, true confession time, I used to spend way too much time. If something would happen and we'll just use a benign circumstance to, to relate, to draw the picture, let's say a, a, 
bad uh, road rage traffic. Someone mm-hmm. cuts you off in traffic. Well, whatever would happen in, in my life, I would take that and I would internalize it and I would think about it and I would talk about it and I would talk about how that was not right. And, to, and I would spend so much time living with whatever the ick situation yes. was that over time, and then you have a lot of those, I would end up getting sick. So finding some changes, finding some ways, some ways to do it. So a lot of it is, is setting boundaries. And if you're someone who is always a people pleaser or that you're always looking for approval, even if you don't subconsciously consciously know you're looking for approval, if you do the work, you figure out yeah. that's why you're behaving that way. Setting boundaries is not easy. That's hard. Well, that takes a skill. And let alone that, you know, uh, I certainly can appreciate, I come from an Italian family mm-hmm. and, and setting boundaries was hard because, you know, being a good person means that you please the family. And if you're not pleasing the family, then maybe that means you're a bad person. And so these are internal messages that we may yeah. or may not be conscious of. Um, but on top of it, it's that much harder when you're dealing with ailing parents because mm-hmm. there is a realistic need. Um, it's not just in our, in their heads. But, you know, I could see it being... Mm, really challenging for some people to even put themselves in a place of saying it's okay for me to set boundaries Mm -hmm. and i'm wondering how did you go from that how did you do that so so a few things i mean there's there's never there's never the one silver bullet there's never the one sort of thing so first is the is being being aware we talk about you know having um self-awareness being aware of the aware of the situation and finding tools and things that i could do in the moment to break that negative cycle of remunerating over over things and, and assigning blame for my bad day onto onto someone else right. first and foremost um when this was at its peak i made a wonderful discovery after talking to my doctor about at the breaking point and with stress and their recommendation was antidepressants. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, I wasn't depressed. Right. Um, so I sought out a different way, a natural way. And that's when I discovered using essential oils. So essential oils have become a huge part of my overall health, wellness and, and well being, because that is something that I could take and I could literally take a bottle of essential oil, which I actually have one right here. And just take take the cap off and breathe in those natural plant aromas. They go when you inhale an essential oil on plant essence, you you breathe it through and it goes past the um, the um, it goes into the limbic portion of your brain, mm-hmm. and that's where decision making, that's where our fight or flight, that's where that is. So I would I would find the certain oils and the blends that would work to take me from a nine rage, anger, whatever it was, hurt, whatever that emotion was, I would use essential oils to help break through that cycle quickly so that I could then do the thought process that I want to do. Because when you're in a heightened state of, whether it's anxiety, anger, whatever it is, you can't always think your way through those things. And you can't just, so I needed, so that helps me flip. Part of the brain gets shut down, mm-hmm. and I think that's the biggest challenge. People are trying to solve a problem from that state, and the the first thing you need to do is change your state so that you can actually think about how you're going to deal with the problem. Um, and, and so there's the, yeah. the changing changing your state. That is exactly it. Making it making a change quick and fast. Yeah. The other things. Then I started to add on exercise. Yeah. And to that, music. In and of itself, um, great, but having a go-to playlist that you can turn on, it's just like the, yeah. that it, it changes your, it does change your, your state oh, huge, and, and working, huge. working out. I, I been, I mean, I, I mentioned I did, um, I did weight loss, but I, for, aside from the last three years, I've led a pretty much sedentary lifestyle. And I yes. bought into the fact that, well, I had rheumatoid arthritis. I can't be expected to yeah. work out and move and it hurts. And so, you know, yeah. that's not yeah. for me. But now that is for me. I, I yes. love it. It's my, yes. so, so by doing, changing your state, doing things for you. And then, you know what? Sometimes you just got to let stuff go. Pick your yeah. battles. Sometimes you don't need to, you don't need to, be right. You don't need to 
to win what I need to do, where my, where my process is, I need to, I need to self, I need to protect myself. I need to yes. not get into a, a yeah. self state and I'm not responsible for the, for other people and how they feel and yeah. what they do. Absolutely. I'm, I'm responsible for me and wanting to do that. And there's, and there's, um, there's meditation and there's mindfulness, there's gratitude having and um, when you're I, I don't think it's possible to be in a straight state of gratitude and self-pity or gratitude and no, anger no. so so having those as your touchstones yeah. and those things that you can go through go to and again being like fiercely protective of that because the self-worth component yeah. finally clicked in that which is amazing and is amazing that's and, you know, I think at the core, I, I always see, you know, I've always mentioned that's my MO probably is that your relationship with yourself is number one. And I think, you know, think of, um, you know, someone that you care about. It could be your dog. It could be uh, your child. It could be. And when you value them, you put time into them. And because it's in that valuing that you want them to be well. And how often we don't think of ourselves. So if we don't value self, then why would we care for self about when, when there's no value? And so the, the, but the one thing I do hear is that you started to put time into yourself. This, mm -hmm. this wasn't like, cause you know, I think, you know, how many, how often do we get so stressed and caught up? And I, even, even with my knowledge of how important it is to take time, sometimes through adversity. I recently lost my parents, as you know, and that went out the door, the, 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 the time, the preserved, reserving that time for self felt like there was no time for that. And, you know, looking back now, I'm going, well, how did I get there when I actually knew not to get there? And mm -hmm. which shows me you can still get there, even though you think you have it figured out how yeah. vulnerable we are to losing self again, right? And um, so in your case, it was like finding self, really. And part of it, I was thinking the other day, someone was asking me, well, how did the radio show come about and what are you doing with the podcast? And in a small way, it's my accountability piece. Yeah. Because I that's what I talk about. That's I, I bring in people and we do just like this. We interview and we talk, talk about our health and wellness and our importance of it. And when I'm helping someone who is sort of in a place where, and I, I, I help and I deal with a lot of my, my audience and, and whatnot are people in the chronic illness community, because that's sort of the, the niche. I do talk a lot about that. And you talked about thinking about someone who you value and why that isn't yourself. Yeah. And I'll often say to someone, take the perspective of, would you say that, would you use that sort of self-talk or would you be that denying of things for your very best friend? What would you tell your very best friend? Wouldn't you want better for her? Yeah. And we've got a funny thing in our society where we don't reward that sort of stuff. Self-care is not selfish, right? I, mean, I know. It's, it's, I, I, I just think that somewhere in there, and I maybe we get caught up with kids, we see them more vulnerable than us and um, and you know, other people more, and then that we make those as reasons, Wh whatever excuses we make, we say, um, I don't have time. This is more important. And even I can tell you, there's a huge resistance to it. Um, I met with Lee Poulos on a regular basis, a psychologist in Vancouver. And, and one of the things he said, and I actually kind of believe this, that, that we sometimes draw from a resource when we're ready to. You know, oh, yes. you know, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And I believe that. I do believe that. I, I've had things, I remember books I've had on my shelf that I haven't looked at. And then mm -hmm. suddenly I'll go, now's the time or, you know, so there's, uh, you know. I'm totally yeah. um, a believer of that. I I also uh, have been working on my my spiritual side and my and my connection to energy and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. It really fascinates me. And I believe that. Um Speaking of, of books, one of the, the pivotal things that happened for, for me in my healing journey, it's when I when I was at my, my lowest point, I actually went out and sought some therapy. Mm -hmm. I went to a local walk-in crisis counseling center because I was I needed some help. Yeah. And after um, some sessions, the counselor that I was seeing recommended this book to me. 
It's by um, uh, Gabor yes. Mate, and it's called When the Body Says No, yes. the, the Cost of Hidden Stress. Yes. And I devoured that book. It was, it was difficult to yeah. read some of those things, and it was difficult yeah. to hear. And it's not, it's not that you're, it's not about blaming, well, you're causing this on yourself. No, it's like, sure. okay, when spe- and it looks at a lot of the things of your family of origin and your early years and dealing with how you're responding to things now. Well, maybe that's because there were needs unmet when you were a younger person yeah. and all of that stuff. And so that was a really, it was validation because I always knew that stress was making me sick. Yes. <laughs> but yeah. to have to read through that to that book and to see the science behind it as well yeah. and the validation. Yeah. And then that again, that made me more fiercely protective of yeah. protecting myself and wanting to lead a thriving empowered life. Yeah. And yeah. I think Gabor Mate is I, I, I like Gabor Mate. I, I I um I know that, you know, in a way if it mirrors in our culture how we have um, learn to even disregard um, the body as a message messenger, and mm-hmm. um, because it really does speak, um, it says no before we can say no consciously, yes. and and yet we can override it, override it, override it until you get to a point where it's screaming at you, and you're debilitated at that point. And then suddenly you go, oh, now I now I have no choice. I have to set a boundary. Yeah, <laughs> so, and that's you know? like if yeah. if um, I was just re- reviewing it again to, before coming in and going, yeah, that that's right. And there was saying like if we if we ignore our emotional the emotional signals that are trying to tell us to pay attention to something, then that's likely going to manifest in a, in a physical one. Yeah, and being able to to recognize that, and it's like it, and part of the thing, the difference the difference of how I handle things now as how I used to bad stuff still happens. Yeah. Stuff still gets, gets crazy. And I don't say, Oh, well, I'm going to grab an oil and this doesn't exist and I'm fine. No, I allow myself to to feel it because if you do not feel that emotion, suppressing and sort of being in denial for for yourself or your situation, I think is, is equally damaging. Equally. So, Feel, figure it out, allow yourself to feel whatever it is yeah. that you're feeling. Just decide and choose yeah. if that's not where you want to stay. If that's where you want to stay, if you want to, some people really yeah. love the drama. Yeah, yeah. And oh, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, it can be. <laughs> um, you know, so, but, but making making that, that choice to, to want to, to want some, something yeah. else and, and keeping to move, to move forward. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, it's, there's, and it's, and it's never, it's never too late within your within your life. It's never too early to start on on good uh, mental health practices, and it's also never too late. Never too late. I mean, I would never yeah. three years ago have thought that I would be in the best shape physically and yeah. emotionally yeah. that of my, of my life. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't even realize it would be possible. Yeah. I. I. And. and that is the part that most uh, I see is so poignant for me because, um, you know, in part of my job, it is to help people change and help them reach that point of change. Um, but I do find that a lot of the things we tell ourselves, this is something that I think is natural, I, you know, I, it, because I, it, you know, we're not talking about unnatural process. I think it's ne- it's natural to become negative. It's it's where our brain tends to go, and and um, how often we say things like, uh, you know, I, I'm too old. I've been like this all my life. What are the? Ch- this is who I am. What are the chance? So you know, we can go through lists of beliefs that solidify and reinforce us to stay exactly where we are and um you know the change of a thought pattern and a belief and you know especially body says no i I, i'm imagining it started to change um the way you you started to listen to things even your body and, and what it was telling you right yeah yeah it's um it's all how whatever comes to us in the, in in our life we actually give away a lot of our power of that we have to be able to choose and to decide how we're going to respond to things yes we do and it's 
it's poss- it is possible to make those changes and the rewards are amazing. Like once to, I always heard they would always say that, oh, well, you know, exercise is going to make you feel better and you're actually going to have the energy and all, all this kind of stuff. Well, I'm now actually one of those people that say know, that, say that too, because when you, you live it and you, you, um, something, some, the, the physical activity component I think is so crucial that even, and no matter what, no matter how much pain a person may be in. And I'm speaking now to the chronic illness community community and people that have chronic pain. You do not have to go to the gym. You don't have to be a superhero. You do what you can with what you've got. And even it's just, it's the consistency and it's blessing your body with movement and water and nutrition. And you'd be surprised what can happen when you start making little changes. Regardless of pain, you know, there's what you don't, you lose it if you don't use it. And Mm -hmm. and that's a fact. And as we age, um, our mobility, uh, you know, I noticed as someone who's been always into fitness for myself, um, as the years went on, I started running and, and I, my body was tightening up. Like I, Mm -hmm. I could do this, but suddenly I can't do this. And I realized, my Lord, this is, you know, we need to, Um, treat the body um, as an organism that needs to be worked it's like the same way Mm -hmm. we need to work our brain is the way we work our body and it's not about whether you have a disability it's keeping your body in the best form you can Mm -hmm. with the condition within the parameters of the condition that exists that it still maximizes it still enhances performance right Mm -hmm. yeah so you've come a long way. Um, I know it's not always easy uh, for people to make that decision, and um, you know, and how I don't know if in the work you've been doing in interviews, have you ever encountered people who um, will say, "Yeah, but I can't," or have you run into? Oh yeah, the, the, I mean, and, yeah. and that's been a whole, you know, again, consciously choosing to even something as simple as my Instagram feed or something. I don't follow, I don't want to consume that kind of stuff because there is so much of that that out there um, that, you know, that's, I'll never get any better and, you know, having to prove how sick I am. And and it's like, it's, yeah, you just, there is a lot of, of that out there. I think that when someone is ready to make that, that, that change, it will happen. You, it's, it's like kind of, I don't know, like trying to trying to convince someone on politics or something. Their beliefs yeah. are their beliefs, yeah. and for me, it was a, a a series of events that happened that I finally was like, enough is enough. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, but but little small small changes. If you can get someone to be interested, to want to, one of the things that I help people a lot with is sleep. The, with um, with the oils because that's another one of my biggest wins. I used to be so dependent on prescription medication. Wow. For, um, Have you eliminated? That oh yeah, or? yeah. Wow. So I was I I I love natural and holistic medicine, but I also love the um, ma- mainstream medicine because I do need that for yeah, pain, pain management to manage my disease activity. But in the last three years, I have been moving forward and basically having, finding better ways for what I call um, taking medications for lifestyle problems, such as, um, such as sleep issues and anxiety or anxiousness or stuff like that. I was, I was dealing with, um, I was popping pills under my tongue when, and when things would get stressful, I was um, dependent on sleeping pills for probably 10 years. And so it's all with all the after I went through chemotherapy, I had such a vile reaction. I'm like, all these of toxins course, and these medicines, course, it makes course. me, ugh. So I've made made the changes over that. And that's what I like to help people with. It's like, okay, well, what if you could make a change with yeah. that? And over time, I think of our, I like to think of our bodies as like we're our own ecosystem. Like think yeah. of your body as the planet and look at what over pollution over time, what it does to, to yeah. our earth. Yeah. Well, where are our, we need to be protective of that. Absolutely. So- even if someone is, I can't, they're in a, um, um, a mindset of, I can't do this. It's, it's too hard. It's difficult. Well, 
where is an area where you'd like to make some change? Where is something? And if you, once you start having successes yeah. in doing, doing something like that, it's like the, the, the domino effect or the corridor effect. Yes. And it's just, it's, it, I get pretty, pretty passionate about it because I, I know I cannot be the only woman in her mid fifties no, that no, no, is no. struggling and also, you know, no. self-medicating and Absolutely. doing this and feeling that they're, and going to her doctor and they're yeah. saying their solutions, how about another prescription? Yeah. How about, how about something else? Cause that's the only tools they have. Yeah. Well, yeah. we have more tools. Yeah. There's, I'm a, I'm, you know, a huge fan of doing the work and, and therapy and all of the different yeah. things that, that, uh, that we can do if we choose and decide it's, it, yeah. it is up to us. So don't yeah. give that power away. <laughs> yeah. I think it is a, a commitment and one, a, and, and it's also a commitment without a, an end point because, um, it's a life change, lifestyle change. Mm-hmm. It's not, um, I reach my goal and then I'm done. It's mm-hmm. it's a way of life and you incorporate it and it might take more time. But my guess is that you would never change it. That would that it's time well spent. It's not time that you go, dear God, I have to put in time. Um you no, know, it becomes an almost like a, a new healthy addiction. Like because yes. it's because you want to you want to to seek that out. I mean, yes. who doesn't want to feel better more often? Yeah. Oh, f- uh, we all do. Incredibly. Yeah. 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 So I and you know I think the other piece that we we didn't talk about was um, what happens as you change, and how do people deal with the change? Um, you know, one of the things I find that is one of the hardest things about us when we change personally is the reactions to the, of the people around us. Um, it's not uncommon when we change for, there is a saying that families, and it could be organizations, but in this case, families seek out homeostasis. Um, they like things to be the way they were. And when things were the way they, because it worked for them. And even if it was, a dysfunctional dynamic, mm-hmm. they're still comfortable in that dysfunctional dynamic. Um, how did you, and because you were still taking care of your mom and your dad in that mix, and um, and I'm sure their needs were high, mm-hmm. you know, how did you negotiate? Because I think that's something we all struggle with, is if I stop doing this, if I stop playing this role, um, people are going to reject me. They're going to judge me. They're going to call me selfish. Mm-hmm. How did you negotiate that? The first thing that comes to mind with that question is saying that I had to be brave. I had to okay. be willing to get a response that I wouldn't, I wouldn't like. And, you know, when you, when someone makes, makes, um, makes a bunch of changes, positive or otherwise, the people around them, Either some are going to be supportive, like yes. you know, if you have an, an amazing spouse, like oh, I do, yes. that's you know the, the encouraging, yes. encouraging, Definitely. and all all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But others, for for whatever reason, relationships do change, right. and and there is there's a lot of it too. I think is back to the energy. I think that as the way that I show up for any conversation, whether it be in person or on a video call or on the phone, I think my energy now is way different than it was three years ago. Oh, I can say it. I can vouch for that. I mean, over the years, I've seen huge changes and been amazingly, you know, surprised to see how how big they've been. And and so with that, um, relation, relationships will, will, will change. And, you know, I'm drawing, I'm, attracting a different 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 type of people with different interests and things yes. and you know habit your habits change and your your circle yes. can change and though with um with negotiating and figuring out how how to reframe a relationship that you are in like in a, in a yeah. caregiving role a lot of that again it was it was um learning learning the skill and shedding the Gosh, this the triggers of feeling that you need to I need know. to be in a certain way. There's a um, a wonderful, fantastic um, caregiving coach here in Nanaimo, um, Saskia De oh um, <laughs> and she did uh, she did the um, last year did a, a caregiver symposium at the at the golf course, and um, I was able to be on the speakers panel talking about uh, caregiving with my dad, and 
So with some of the tools and, and things that I learned from her, it's just to re recheck yourself and to let you know that I, the person who is in a caregiving role, who is your number, you're, you are still the most important person. The same, you have to take care of yourself first. Mm -hmm. You cannot. And so it's just renegotiating and it's standing up as being, it's being brave. Mm -hmm. Part of it is saying, if, you know, if you ruffle some feathers, okay. And then what tends to happen in, at least in our dynamic, yeah. it just blows over and everything's back to the reset. And so now I'm, I'm yeah. taking it back and I'm going, wow, I used to let whatever stuff bother yeah. me so much when everyone else just moves on. Yeah. So why yeah. was I owning that? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we have levels of conscientiousness. And I also think women are more geared towards taking on the mm -hmm. role of harmonizing relationships and being responsible for them. You know, I don't know what your thoughts are, Dylan, because my experience has been, and you, you have a specific relationship with your family, but um, is that um, men have been, you know, I come from a Italian culture, so there's been a lot more right given to, you know, pursue your career, do what you need to do. And women have, in in again, from my culture, relegated to the role of caretaking and and to be someone that doesn't take on that role would be looked upon in a more negative light um oh uh, yeah know? possibly i think maybe more um with the older generations yes uh i and this might just be like my opinion but like i look at the world right now and i think women like make it turn around um so no. You're a it, unique breed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, yeah. But I think it's, it's changing. Like there's more, it's still very, it's still very asymmetrical, the roles of men and women, I think. But, well, it's, it comes um, down to It's how, symmetrical yeah. in the, like the value. And uh, definitely now more and more we're seeing, of course, like women go into whatever career they want to go into. And I know quite a few men who are in the position of like a stay at home dad now. Um, that are I in my see, age. And I see it's not that, like a taboo definitely. or something no. they're ashamed of or anything like this. No, I, um, I've also, was, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah. It's just, it was just more appropriate based right. on um, their circumstances. Yeah. And it's just, it was, it seemed more functional for them, I guess. I, so yeah, sorry. What were you saying? No, no, no. I, I totally, <laughs> and what you're saying, I totally agree with. Uh, I think um, that it's, that uh, there's been a shift I and I agree with the fact that there's been a shift. I've also seen that while women have pursued careers, they've in many cases they've also still had the responsibility of coming home and cooking and taking on those. And I certainly have met more men who are stay-at-home men. Um, I you know I don't know how much. Um, I remember saying was it last week or the other uh, week that the law can change, but it takes a lot longer for the mentality to change. Um, I think we're mm -hmm. still working towards that. I don't know that we're fully there. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I certainly think, it, you know, I went back to Italy after the economy had collapsed in 2008. Um, you know, there, there was lots of still that disparity and that, that was still very much present that I, that I observed. Um, and, you know, it takes time, right? And that's the courage to stand and to claim space for yourself when you've had a life where you didn't. Mm -hmm. um, that's not a small change, you know. And, and you mentioned the corridor effect, which I think we might have talked about before, Dylan. Do you remember the corridor effect? Oh, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead. I, I the, love that like, concept. You open the one door. Yeah. You, you really <laughs> walk into the corridor. And I think people, when they think of change, they get overwhelmed. They think, mm -hmm. oh, my God, I it's so much. And, you know, everything you've mentioned, fitness and meditation. And I know you go for morning walks. Um, you have rituals in mm -hmm. place. You do your work with oils. You monitor your boundaries. You do reading. Um, that would overwhelm someone hearing that going, oh my God, that's like monumental <laughs> major <laughs> changes. But I think you made a point where it's, you didn't make all those changes in a day. Gosh, no. It was a, a process of moving in that direction. And it started with one change. 
And, and once the corridor effect is essentially, if you want something in your life, take the step in the door. Don't worry about how big it is. Mm -hmm. Just walk into the corridor. Once you're in the corridor, things start to open up for you. Many other doors start to show up. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm assuming when you mentioned it, that's what kind of happened for you. It wasn't like a Every suddenly, all she's meditating. That's and right. Da -da. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hurrah, like a... <laughs> right? No, and and the other thing that I'd like I'd like to say on that too is that you're have grace with yourself. Don't it's not perfection. When yeah. I first started going to um, going to work out at the at the gym, I could barely I could just say my endurance level, my strength, my balance, all of that. I mean, I, I'm sure I looked pretty ridiculous, but I didn't, I didn't care. And I just keep, you keep going, you learn, it's just like anything, a habit, a new skill, you, you're not expected to know all this stuff and be perfect, yeah. but just keep, keep going. And I think I always come back to what, one of the reasons that has made me commit so strongly in this area is knowing the reason why I'm doing it. Yeah. And the reason why I'm doing it, it's sure not to fit into a certain size. It's not to impress anybody else. It's for the value for the person who I'm choosing to be ultimately responsible for and love to the best ability. And that is myself. I love that. Thank you, Sandra. Yeah. And, and so you've gotten to the place of, of challenging and, you know, one day what I, what I would like, cause I think, it's so the beliefs we carry, like it's selfish to think of myself. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a bad person if I'm taking care of myself. I think those are hard ones to break. And um, especially if you've been, you know, brought up with that kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, so I'm assuming that it's through the process as you started examining things with therapy and reading and that you came to an insight that this is not me being selfish. This mm -hmm. is me taking care. And I honestly believe that if you want to be vibrant in life and you want to be your best version of yourself, mm -hmm. that it requires self-care. Um, and it doesn't mean you don't give. It just means that you're filling, you're filling the pot first um, and you're not running on empty so mm -hmm. that you're ensuring yourself as being able to be present, right? Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm continually challenging myself on is to make sure that through my show and what I, what I do, that I do let people know both, both sides of the equation and share more of the times when I'm not out there going to the gym and being being yeah. amazing because after um you know after I have a, a day if I go go to the gym and I go grocery shopping and I cook a meal and you know I clean the bathroom or whatever the next day I have, I have it's a rest day. Yeah. Like and I and I used to struggle with a little bit of not so much guilt but you know not wanting letting letting people know that I'm not yeah. out there yeah. a, achieving every every Absolutely. single day but as, accepting it first for myself knowing that of course that's okay. Yeah. And yeah. sharing that with others too, and letting letting them know that that's that's part and parcel of of having having a chronic condition, which is so wonderful because it humanizes the whole experience. And yeah. knowing that, you know, when whenever I've tried to give someone an idea of the trajectory of of recovering through something, I've always said it's not a straight line. Mm -hmm. You're not just going up and up and up and then becoming more and more magnificent. Even though that sounds wonderful, that often as we're on the journey. Mm -hmm to include the times where we slip, we fall off, um, um, and we need to sort of reorient and get our footing again. And, and that's where we learn and grow. That's if where we learn. The, if it's a, if everything is going, then I, I actually don't think that is, that's certainly not the life that I would want. Yeah. I, I like, yeah. I've learned to I'm I'm a I'm a problem solver. I give me a challenge. Let me see what I can do with that. <laughs> I've definitely seen that in you. You're fierce. <laughs> but uh, you know, I don't know if there's something else. I think that's an amazing story, Sandra, because um, I've certainly been witness to the changes, um, and I have a lot of respect and admiration because I do know how easy easy it is to stay. And and you know, we get in our comfortable 
uncomfortable bubble. It's an uncomfortable bubble that feels familiar and um, becomes our story and that feels immutable. And, you know, I for me, it's always, we got to get past the, I'm too old, I'm too this, I'm too that, and move on to what can you do? And look for role models. And I think what's great is you are, in essence, a role model for someone who's mm-hmm. had chronic pain. Um, we're not talking about perfection. We're talking about you're you're always striving to stay as healthy and in the best well being as you can, and you're taking care of yourself. Um, so you know, I think that's a wonderful role that you're playing because that that's going to help people. Um, and is there? I wonder if there's anything you want to leave us with as we close off today. Well, just that if I am a role model or an example for others, that is super rewarding and that's very humbling and it's the something that means the world to me to be able to have someone hear something that I say or to see a change that I've made and for them to for it to spark something for them to even just be be curious even just think if it might be if it might be possible so much of it is our mindset and how we approach things and I think that everything there's, there's just about every area of your life where you can tweak and you can make improvements, but you have to want it yes. and value yourself and know that you are absolutely worth it, worth it and reach for it and you'll be amazed what can happen. No matter what your circumstance. Absolutely. And, and you know, maybe a good starting point is reach out to people. Um, and certainly if, if you are someone who's struggling with chronic pain and has a uh, experience yourself sort of confined in your life by it perhaps tuning into your show would be a a good start which is uh, chronically driven yeah chronically driven it's um wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts um spotify or or anchor or wherever that is and um i i'm also on instagram chronically driven as well that's my actually my my favorite platform and developing the, the same under under youtube and over on facebook i'm at chronic wellness essentials wonderful thank you so much and Dylan, I just any final comments you want to add? I think um, one of the best tools that Sandra mentioned that's worked for me in my life is really looking at the things that are in your control and that are not. Yes. Um, and because it's so easy to be upset about politics and about <laughs> you know COVID and all of these external things, and even when you guys mention. You know, it's so hard to take care of yourself and sometimes you feel guilty, but ultimately that's the only thing that you do have control of. Yeah. Um, yeah. So try try to get control of it, I guess. And it's awesome to hear a story with uh, someone who has. <laughs> so well, thank you so much, Sandra, for, for sharing that with us. Well, thanks, Dylan. Thanks for being part of the conversation. Yeah, thank you, Dylan. I always love your insights. And, uh, you know, maybe one day we'll talk a little bit more <laughs> about about some of the changes you made because I know you've made yeah, some maybe, changes maybe. in your life, right? yeah, <laughs> we'll see yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll give that time but uh, Sandra it's been so great to have you and I've, I've known you for a while and it's been a pleasure sort of watching this whole journey as you've been on it and certainly maybe we'll have you again sometime to talk some more if you like and I'd love that so thank thanks you thanks for having me here today and, uh, until next time take good care wonderful and I want to uh, wish everyone uh, tuning in, or do we say tuning in at this point? I don't even know. But wish you a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon, whatever day it might be. And uh, here's to your well-being and putting yourself first, setting up those boundaries, and taking good care of yourself. All the best. 